So today we're going to talk about um, readers and writers and buffers, um, just I.O. in general. Uh, this, this is a shorter slide deck. There's only about 40 slides here. Um, the, it, this one does require a little bit of familiarity with the, the interface, you know, the, the duct typing aspect of, of Go, uh, for whatever that's worth. So the, you know, in Go, the, I guess technically it's structural typing, but you know, I think colloquial or more people are familiar with the, the, the phrase and, and, the, and the concept of duct typing. Basically, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, right? Um, Objective C or Java, you know, they're called protocols. If you conform to the protocol or not, um, you know, in, um, in Python, you use uh, methods like as attribute to check if, if it implements a given method. You know, it's kind of the same thing. Um, but the, the concepts we're talking about here in Go is that we've got these interfaces. You know, again, you know, if, if it reads like a reader, it's a reader. That's, that's kind of like you know, the whole bringing it together, right? If you implement the method read that takes one argument, which is uh, Byte slice and returns the number of bytes you've read and, and an error. If you if you implement this argument with the I'm sorry this this method with the exact same function the method signature, then you are a reader. Uh, similar with write, if you implement the write method on your object or your struct, uh, however you want to call it, um, then you are a writer, right? And then you can pass those in into anything that expects a, a, a reader or a writer, uh, respectively, right? This this is a one of those things that you're going to see all over the standard library in Go, they're just they're just kind of everywhere. Um, the um, the the library itself makes use of this. It's it's um, you know the, I haven't seen like a, an official Go Golang blog post on it. It's just kind of one of those things where people kind of pick it up and, and use it and learn it and um, find it. Uh, you know the over time, most people kind of tend to to come to appreciate just kind of the the way the the interface, you know, the elegance of it in some places. It's not always elegant, you know, you have to work around it, but for the most part, uh, it actually works really, really well in practice. Um, so conceptually, right, when you're talking about readers, right, a reader is an object that's got data inside of it that you can read out and then somehow use that data, right? You know, that, that's what a reader is, something where you, it, it, inside of it, there's some kind of data that you're trying to get, get out and, and use or, or pass on or move or split off or whatever you do, right? Writers are, are similar, but but kind of opposite. Um, you know, you have data of some kind. You know, whether it's you know a string or JSON or, or just a random number of bytes or something, and, and you want to shove it into a writer, and then you expect the writer to do something with it. You know, um, it might be compress it or encode it or, or or save it. You know, or or maybe write it to a file or store it in another buffer. But the you have data and you want to do something with it. That's normally where you see the writer aspect. Of shove it over the network somewhere and make it land somewhere else, things like that. Make sense so far? Any questions? All right. At a very high level, when we talk about readers and writers and Go, this is all we're really talking about. You, know, you are using data of some kind and it either comes from somewhere else or you are um, putting it somewhere else. Um, so the best practice, so starting with reader, you know, the, this actual read interface, right? The, the basic functionality is um, that when I when I call the read method, right, I give it a byte slice, right, and that's where it's going to read the data out and shove it in this byte slice named p, right, this p variable is where it's going to put it, right, and then it also tells me how many bytes it, it read out and if there is any problems doing so, you know, like like a network problem or a file problem or or a, a malformed data problem of some kind, things like that, or end of file is is, is probably one of the more common ones you see, right. In practice. Um, you may get a successful read if error equals nil, but very, very often when you're talking about files, you'll see the error actually equals end of file, right? To, but that's, that's not a real error, that's just like, you know, the file is done error. So the, unlike most uh, functions, this is implementation, you know, implementation dependent, and sometimes a, a specific error means actually things work the way you want. So because readers are not restricted to just things like, you know, files on disk, um, you know, the the actual success is, is a little bit more implementation dependent, right? If you're talking about um, reading something off the network, then like a broken pipe is is is, is a very severe um, is a very severe uh, error statement that'll come back. But you know, like an end of file just might be, oh, the sender is done, and this is just the sentinel that they're using to, you know, that's just the signal that they're using to let us know that he's done. Things like that. So you got to be a little bit, um, uh, you got to dig into the documentation a little bit for specific implementations of the Um now, the way um, reader works is that 
if you give it um, a bunch of stuff here, you know, if you give it a large um, byte slice to work with, um, even if it doesn't actually read a ton of bytes, it, it might actually use that as scratch base to do its reading thing. You know, sometimes if you're talking about things like like compression or decompression or, or, or encoding of some kind, sometimes it actually needs more disk space than it's given, and it might actually use all of this, even though, you know, if you're talking about compressed data, right, you know, it, the actual final version of, of, of the, the compressed data it puts out, you know, might be very, very small, but it might have used quite a bit of um, the, the space as, as kind of like scratch in, in some cases, so you got to be careful of that. And of course, um, the the internal implementation of the reader is, is not going to do anything with P. It's not going to muck around with it or retain it or, 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 or do anything um, excessively weird with it with respect to memory management and, and, and garbage collection and whatnot. Um, the, the thing about read is that uh, if, if, if you want to read a very large, if you're trying to read like a large file and it's starting to take a long time because it's either over the network or on a slow disk, Right? You might actually have to call read successive times, right? Basically, this, the size, the, the maximum size of this slice is kind of what determines how much you can, you know, the maximum amount you can read in one chunk. But read by design is designed to be called multiple times so that if there is a slow operation, that, you know, the, it'll give you, you know, a few chunks at a time, right? You know, even though this thing could, for example, hypothetically fit like a thousand bytes, it might just give you the first two and say, you know what, call me again to get the remaining. You know the remaining 998. That's an, a kind of a contrived example, but uh, hopefully it makes sense. Um, now a lot of this stuff here is just straight out of the documentation, but what they're what they're really talking about is that sometimes you're going to read um, an, an empty file or an empty socket, right? And there's just nothing there, right? So there is special behavior around things that return n equals zero, meaning it says I tried to read but I got zero bytes back. Basically, right? If if you do something dumb and, and give it a byte slice that has no room and, and nothing in there, there's some weird behavior and this just kind of talks about that, right? If if you're trying to read stuff and, and you know like the the it returns zero for, for the number of bytes read, you know, for the most part, you, you really you really that's really a signal by convention that's saying to you that you know everything's okay, you're just trying to read something that doesn't exist or, or something that's you know, there's nothing there. There's nothing there to read, things like that. So a lot of times when you're reading things, especially over the network, right, you'll get things known as partial reads, where saying, you know, of this file, I read half of it, and then I got an error, right? Conventionally, because you get these two things at once, what, what that really means, and this last um, bullet point is talking about is, you know, I successfully read n bytes, and then the error happened. It's, it's kind of the conceptual way you want to understand how the, the return values work. All right, there are many, 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 many kinds of readers in the standard library, right? Here are some obvious variants, right? You know, there, there are different interfaces which are like combinations of, you know, a reader and a writer and a reader and a closer and a reader and a seeker. Um, I keep hoping that one day the Go team will make a reader, writer, closer, seeker, but I haven't seen that yet. I don't know why. Uh, but it feels like we're close. It feels like we're almost there. But you can make your own. You can make your own if you really want to. That's not very hard at all. Um, the, there are byte readers and rune readers. If you want a single a single byte or a single Unicode um, character, you can use these. You know, and that just reads one at a time. They're special special kind of one at a time readers. Um, there are um, these things are, are just kind of special case, right? You know, pipe readers and, and section readers. If you want to just read like a, from an offset and a length, you know, a, a small given section of a of a reader, you can you can use some of these other guys or, or have readers that have um, limited you know internal buffers. You know, there, there, there are a lot of different variators, right? Uh, variants. And all of these are readers, so like if, if there is a function that, that requires a reader argument, you can use any of these that makes sense, right? There, there's a lot of weird, you know, intentionally broken joke ones that you find in IO test, and, and they're kind of funny, like, you know, a reader that, that always throws an error halfway through, and, and a reader that just returns one byte, even though you kind of expect it to return more, things like that. So uh, those, those are more for testing and, and kind of simulating brokenness and, and broken uh, environments, uh, but, but there's a bunch of them. You can compose readers in the sense that if you have a bunch of different readers, you can mix and match them in different ways, right? Um, so this here just makes one of those limited readers that we saw earlier. There's a multi-reader, which will, um, here, you can give it a whole, you know, one or more readers. Like, if you give it three readers, it'll kind of read from the first one and read from the second one and then read from the third one. So you're, com you're composing, like, one master reader out of, out of three or four, you know, other readers, things like that. The T reader is interesting, right? Basically. As you read it, it will simultaneously write it to somewhere else. You know, like like a, you know like the 
like the Unix command T or, or like a like a two-way fork or the road or pipe or something like that. So, so there's a lot of different ways to kind of mix and match um, the readers as it were. Um, you will see readers all over the place in the standard library. You know, we talked a little bit about IO tests, but you know, buff IO bytes is probably one of the more common places that you're going to use. But you know, in the crypto package, debug, you know, packet, you know, all over, you know. Compress and encoding and image and archiving, those are very, very common places that you'll see readers because there's a lot of data being moved and, and being manipulated from one place to the other. So you're going to see it all over there. Um, of course, text and, and mime, and, and, and there's more, right? I, I get tired of looking. Yeah. What's up? The reader writer close will uh, yeah. close the file once the operation is done, or how is it? I'm sorry, say that again? The read write closer. Yeah. So how, how does it work? So reads writes and also closes the file. Yeah. So the so the closer is is another interface where it just has the close method. Basically, it's saying whatever underlying implementation, right? It needs to know when the user is done, right? Okay. You know, the user being the programmer, the developer, or or maybe an actual end user, right? Okay. And so in addition to reading and writing, you've got the close operation where, uh, in the case of like a file handle. You can read it, and you can write it, do whatever. But when you're done at the very end, you gotta just hit close so that the, the underlying OS or system or, or something can can clean up. And all the calls are uh, synchronous, right? It depends on the implementation. Yeah, some readers and writers um, support you know you know asynchronous operation operation. Some don't. You, you gotta dig into the documentation. Um, the Normally, you want to think of them as as, as synchronous. Is like you know, the, you want to you probably want to you're probably best served by assuming that they don't treat you know simultaneous operation well. Mm -hmm. um, but there there are exceptions. There are some that are you know Go routine safe and thread safe, and, and the documentation should specify that. Okay. Yeah. So this is a higher level interface. The the actual implementation dependent details like synchronous or not, you know, it depends on on what kind of reader it is. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Can you go to the next slide? This one? Or this one? Oh, oh that's Ollie. He's our CEO. He paid for the pizza know. and the beer. <laughs> thank you. Every time, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, did you have another? What was your question? Uh, go back to this. Uh, I think. Uh, this one? Yeah. I think it's clear. Okay. okay. <clears throat> good, good. And again, this this is all in the standard documentation. Most of it's in the I/O package, so you can look for more details in there. Um, the, it, it may seem a little weird now, but you know, by the time you guys are done here, you're going to be reader and writer experts, and this is going to be pretty obvious. All right. Any other questions so far? All right, you guys are way smarter than me. This took me years to understand. Um, so we're going to switch to writers for a little bit, and then we're going to get into some concrete examples. Um, of, of so writers is, is very, very similar. Basically here, um, the, the way the writer works is, is you, know, you have data, and you want to stuff it in the writer and have something on the inside of the writer do something with it. So this is the data you give it. You give it a byte. Um, you give it a bunch of bytes, you know, hopefully you know, useful bytes of some kind. Um, and then it will tell you how many bytes were successfully written. Um, and in the case of any unsuccessful, either partial writes or, or, um, or totally unsuccessful, and it'll be zero, and you'll, and you'll get the error back um, you know, there. So again, there is this concept of, of, of like a write, you know, working a partial write that's successful and then an error, and, and that's why we've got the two different error uh, things. How much of it was successful, how much write was successful, and then after that, what error occurred? Um, so you will actually always see uh, an, uh, an error pop up if, um, in this case, the, the write was not fully successful. Um, you, the, the implementation of whoever is doing write, you know, they're, they're not allowed to mess with this. So when, when you do pass it data, you can you know, pass it things like, you know, the, you know, in, in this case, the reference, you know, but uh, things like that, and not worry about the, the write operation mucking around with your data. Um, and then again, like the the right implementation on the inside, it's, it's not supposed to to ma uh, maintain. Uh, I'm sorry, retain any any references to p for for uh, in order to respect the garbage collector. Um, there there are slightly fewer writes. It's just a it's just a more straightforward thing. I think um, when, when you're stuffing something in rather than you know the many different ways you can pull it out. Um, these again, most of these just come out of the the standard. Um, uh, Standard library. There is this variant of like if you want to write to like three or four or five or ten or, or a thousand places at once, you can use the multi writer. You can throw as many writers in there as you want, comma separated or, or even a slice of writers. 
um, things like that. And, and it will basically give you one writer which routes to all the other writers, you know, like a, Does that like a split. Writes, I'm sorry? <coughs> so it writes everything to all of them? Yeah, so whatever you write into the thing that's returned here, whatever you write into a multi-writer will be um, not really simultaneous, but it'll be under the hood and it feels simultaneous from a human perspective. But it writes that data to all of the writers that, that, you know, that make up the inside of it. At the same time, or is it just like one after another? Uh, I believe the actual implementation is is one after the other, but you know the but it, it's chunked up internally implementation specific, right? It, it, it kind of depends on how fast you write to it and things like that. Yeah, the um, I haven't cracked open the source code in a while, so the, it, it's not perfectly simultaneous and it's not perfectly um, um, asynchronous. At that point. All right. There are, similar to readers, there are writers everywhere, up and down and inside and outside of the standard library. Um, the obvious ones are things like, again, encoding and compression and archiving, right? You know, these are things where you have data and you, you want to do something. You want to encode it into JSON. You want to um, compress it or, or decompress it, things like that. You know, so it's pretty obvious. Um, Godoc has a, a special one for, for modifying um, stuff that goes through its um, processing pipeline. Um, the most famous one, and the, probably the, one of the more used ones, besides the actual bytes buffer, is the response writer. I think many of us are familiar, if you've ever written a Go web app, you've touched this before. And, and this is basically saying, when you get an HTTP request, like a get or a post or, or whatever, um, you have to write the response back out to the to the client. Right? And, and so this I'm is starting to clean up a bunch of that list. Make sense so far? Uh, all right. Um, Lots more examples of that coming later. Um, all right, so using readers and writers, you know, conceptually, again, back to this magical, mythical, conceptual world, right? You want to think of them as, as, as just kind of like pipes or, or inputs and outputs, right? You know, that you can connect them serially if you need to, like hook up a bunch of readers and writers. You know, read from this one and, and write into that one, or, or or read from here and into the writer, things like that, right? You, you know, we talked about how you can tee them off or, or multi them in, in, in many different ways. Um, you can, you know, the route the data into a file or, or out of a file into a, into an out of standard, you know, standard input and output and error if you need to. You can route it into and out of buffers. You know, buffers is a very, very important concept to go, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, from if once the data is in a buffer, you can convert that to a a byte slice. You know, a more traditional, you know piece of static data or, or, or a string um, in some case, in, in, in pretty much any case. So the, there, is, you know, there is a lot of ways to convert you know, these, these fairly um, dynamic pipes into more traditional uh, variables like you know, pure byte, um, byte slices or, or strings, things like that. And, and you should have normally, if you've done Go for any length of time, you've come across that concept many times. So. Um, one of the main ways you can use when you can do this conversion, right, is, is to use the read all function that's based in IO, IO util. And, and that basically turns a reader, it helps you convert a reader into a byte slice, right? Other variants of this is bytes.buffer um, has a similar convenient method, you know, where it turns the, the buffer itself, it turns the contents of the buffer into bytes or, or into strings, right? You know, it's, it's the same thing. We're, we're, we're doing this conversion from a, a buffer or a reader into uh, a discrete uh, variable, uh, a discrete uh, piece of data. Um, the, you want to be careful about this. Usually, if this happens at the end of a long chain of readers and writers, you're doing it the right way. If this happens a lot of times, you know, and you're constantly converting from readers to bytes and writers to, to bytes and, and then back to readers or back to writers, things like that, then you're probably doing it wrong, right? The, if you're taking a reader and converting to a byte and then stuffing into a writer, that, that's an extra conversion that you're kind of wasting, right? Normally, you could just you know directly route from the reader into the writer is, is kind of the more the way you want to think about it, right? Rather than um, rather than having this conversion steps in between, if, if you're trying to pipe these things, just, just pipe them directly with the with the IO copy command. Any questions there? So uh, when I do the conversion to the string, yeah. uh, by default it's Unicode or uh, yeah. yeah, all the all, strings are all Unicode. strings are Unicode. Yeah. Okay, UTF-8 specifically. Okay. And one more question, basic question from before. Uh, when I when I want to read, like say just 64 bytes, but my buffer is big. Uh, if I want to specify that, okay, read only 64 bytes of it. 
How do I specify that in a, for a read call? Um, so for a read call, you would you would use something like a um, limit limit reader, a limited reader, oh, okay. right? You could limit to to n number of bytes, okay, things okay. like that. Um, you know, or you know, some of some of the convenience methods will ask you. The other thing you can do is is when you actually do the read, is to just make this byte slice, just make it at capacity of sixty four bytes. Okay. All right. So if you just want to use the default readers, things like that. Okay. That make sense? Yeah. So there's a couple different ways you can, you know, slice and dice that that particular code. Um. Where were we? All right. Here you go. Okay. Any questions so far? You guys with me? Anybody falling asleep? Yeah. It's not exactly the most exciting Go topic. We're not we're not quite talking Go routines or channels, but um, this is this is this is intermediate Go. This, if, if this stuff is obvious and and and, and drop dead simple and, and well understood to you, you're in a really strong place at this point. Um, so buffers, right? So just real quick, copy and pasting from Wikipedia. Um, in computer science, a data buffer, or just buffer, is a region of physical memory storage used to temporarily store data while it is being moved from one place to another. Um, not to be confused with Warren Buffer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for laughing. I appreciate it. Um, so buffers in Go, you will use these a lot. Again, they're, they're a big part of how you convert from readers and writers to <coughs> things like byte slices and strings. Um, the, the most common implementation you're going to use is just a regular bytes.buffer, right? And a standard library, you know, struct that, that does a lot of the convenient stuff on the inside for you. It's a relatively cheap. It's not that much more expensive than an actual, you know, byte array. And, and, and lets you do a lot of good things. Um, it, it, for the most part, if, if, if you, um, it, it lets you very easily turn a reader into a, a byte or a string. You know, the bytes.buffer itself implements all the different functions. It does the reader and the writer for you and whatnot. So when you, when, when you put your data in a byte, byte buffer, um, it can be a reader or a writer to anywhere else, um, if that makes sense. Um, so, so again, like because it, it implements both, you know, you can read from it or you can write to it and, and all those things just kind of work. Um, the, conceptually, when you actually use it, and I don't know why I say conceptually like eight times in this presentation, it's probably because I've been uh, a little, uh, maybe my thesaurus is broken yesterday, but, but when you think about using the bytes up buffer, the first thing you want to do is think of how you want to initialize it, or think of what the first thing you're going to do with it. If the first thing you're going to do is read from the buffer, then you're going to initialize it slightly differently than the first thing you're going to do is write to it. You know, after that, it, it will be both, and you can use it as both a reader or a writer, but the, the first time you use it, uh, the way you init, initialize a, a byte set buffer, um, uh, kind of depends on how you, you plan on using it for the first time. Make sense? So, so the golden rule of buffers, right? And, and this is my golden rule. This is not anyone else's golden rule. But if, if you're making a buffer that you are going to write into, like you have data and you want to stuff it in the buffer, you use new bytes.buffer, right? And, and that basically just creates a, a brand new um, buffer pointer for you to use. Um, for a read buffer, 99% um, of the time, people are going to use new buffer, bytes.new buffer. And this just creates a read-write buffer for you to use. Um, there is a convenience variant of that if, if you're going to stuff string data into it, just because there's a lot of string manipulation uh, that happens with, with buffers. So the, this is the same exact thing, except you give it string instead of slice of bytes. There is a slightly more efficient read-only variant of a, of, a, of, a, of a string buffer that you can use um, in the strings package, where you can make a, a read-only um, string-based buffer if you want to. And, and that's just kind of a a slight variant. But normally, you're, you're going to stick with the, the bytes one, because uh, at least in my experience, I, I spend more time working with slices of bytes than I do with strings. But you know, it kind of depends on what you're making. Make sense so far? All right, again. So write buffer, use new bytes.buffer. It creates an empty one that you can stuff whatever you want. For read buffers, use one of these. Just figure out the right one for your work, for your use case. Um, once, once you do have a buffer, though, like if, if you if you initialize a brand new buffer that's got the data in it, you can write to it if you want to. Again, it's, it's, it's read write. So an example of using the, the read buffer, right? So here, um, you know, these, these are the three functions we talked about last time. So bytes that new buffer and you give it some kind of source and it'll popula um, populate a brand new buffer initialized with uh, a copy of the data that you gave it. So new buffer string is, is the same thing as if you pass it a string and it'll give you a string buffer, you know, um, which is initialized with the data, you know, the string you provided. And similar here, if you want a read only string buffer, 
use the strings on new reader, give it some source string to, to start with. So, so now anywhere that asks for an IO reader as an argument, you can pass e you know, any of these into it you know, um, and, and be, be jolly and successful in all your days. You with me so far? All right. So the write buffer example is, 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 is actually pretty simple. You just kind of make a new one and then you where that asks for a writer to stuff stuff you know, that you want to put into. You can either stuff stuff in there yourself or pass it to some function that will stuff stuff in there on your behalf. Um, you know, it's pretty simple. When you're done, you've got this buffer that you know someone else has written to or you have written to, depending on how uh, whatever code flow you're working with. Any questions so far? Oh, good. This is easy. You guys are lightweights or, or experts, I should say. Makes my job easy. Um, so we got lots of examples coming up. So fscan, this is part of the format package, and it's basically um, more reader stuff. There's more pizza, by the way. Did anybody not get enough pizza? We have three more here for you guys. OK. Um, what's Do you up? have these slides online? Or? Yeah, yeah. It's at gotutorial.net. I just uploaded that. Um, so fscan is, is a terrible name, but if you if you were programming the 70s or 80s, you might recognize it. Basically, what it means is that you give it a reader, and you give it a bunch of stuff. And what it's going to do is um, scan from the reader, and it's going to scan the data that's in the reader and stuff it into the variables you give it. Right. So an example of that is right here. Basically, we have we, we created in this case we're manually creating a reader with, with some source string of some kind, right? And then what we do is when we scan the, the data that's inside the reader, remember we read from it, we pull the data out, and we do something it. What the scanner does is it reads the data, it pulls out the source string, and it kind of separates them by spaces and throws them sort of throws them into these variables, right? So we're going to see here that the, the first word is first word and this actually, when you run this, it, it kind of does exactly what you expect. Let's go back. So let's see if we can do this. Maybe not Okay, so when we run this, um, we see that the the scanner is is reading the data and trying to stuff things into the first into these three variables we made. It turns out it can only find two of them. This is the two here. I don't know if you guys went back and see that before I hit the end of file. The first word is string. The second word is I'm sorry. The first word is source. The second word is string, and the third word is blank. Now, so this kind of does what you expect to do. Um, this is actually kind of cool. F scan is kind of smart. Like if you change things to ints and put like numbers in here, it'll it'll parse numbers correctly and floats and things like that, assuming you have the right type in here. So feel free to play around with this, right? If you do um, if you do this. If you change it to an int, for example, the first word is a zero, and then all of a sudden it, it, it gets an error, and so things just start to break. So, yeah. um, but if, if you make this a, a one, if you do give it an integer, then things are just going to start to work. Right? You get the one and a string, and, and even though the first word is actually an int, it is able to parse it and populate the, the actual um, concrete type correctly. So, so f, f strings got a little bit of smarts on the inside. All right, makes sense? Fairly straightforward. Okay, so here is an example of a writer. Um, fprint example is, is the opposite variant, right, of format printing. Basically, we take the, um, what it gives us is a writer, which is something we're going to write data into, right, and, and we give it a bunch of variables, right. So last time we gave it a string that we were reading out and parsing. This is the opposite. We, we give it a bunch of things that we want to turn into strings. So in this case, we're giving it high, you know, we're giving it one string and two integers, right? And when we when we call fprint, right, we write all three things into the write buffer, right? So this is just an empty write buffer. We're creating a brand new empty write buffer, and then we're we're printing out what what it looks like. And you'll see here an example of the convenience method string, which turns our um, our buffer into a string for us. So when we look at this one, hopefully this works. Let's see if we can make this happy. Um, so we see that um, it processed six bytes and it wrote out it wrote out hi two three. Now fprint um, this one will inject spaces between non-strings. So that's why there's extraneous space here. That's just kind of the, some of the smarts, right? So if you give it three strings, that they're going to be concatenated tightly together. If you give it three integers, there'll be spaces in between them. 
makes sense. There, there's also the variant, the f print f and the f print ln, if, if you want to use different logic for how to handle spaces and things like that. All right. A lot of very handsome and satisfied faces with these examples here, I can tell. So, wonderful. so if you were to go back to, can you, can you go back, to, uh, or actually back to the example so I can see the output? Sorry. So if you were to f scan that, yeah, this? and you yeah, the the high two three, yeah, if you were to f scan that and pass it string in int, would yeah. it no it would reverse keep, right because f scan does basically space separation. Okay. So so they're, they're not in they're kind of opposite, but they're not like they're not like it's not like a round trip. It's not designed for round trips. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, it would just kind of coincidentally work if you had three integers and three integers, but in, in this case, you know. The, the fact that we have a string and, and two ints means that we got weird spacing here, and that'll break some. Um, all right, so f print, f Okay, read all. We talked about this one before. This is the one that um, use when you need to, but but don't overuse it. If you see yourself using this two or three times in the same piece of data, you probably want to consider some other concat, you know, some other you know piping or concatenation methods instead. Usually, um, my my rule of thumb is. Uh, I'm using readers and writers up until the very, very end where I convert it to a byte or a string as necessary. So usually this is the, one of the last things you want to do if you've got a bunch of, of reader-write uh, types or flows in between. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. So this one here is, is, is basically, we, we again, we manually create a reader, right? We, we stuff it with source string. Um, the, what we do is we take from this reader, we read all the bytes in it, right? And, and this gives us the string that we read, the red string, right? And then basically we're saying, well, the source and, and the red string should be the same. And, and this is going to return exactly what you think. It's going to print out this here if you go to this link. So you can play around with that. So very trivial, simple example um, of doing that. You know, because this is a, a strings reader, there, there are some convenience methods you can use as well. But, you know, this is just an example of a, a very, very, very contrived example of using read all. Um, so compress and archive and encoding, they're kind of be, going to be all the same. Basically. In, in one of the compressed methods, like like the Flate or the gzip or, or whatever, I think there's like four or five of the, of the common algorithms that's in the standard library, right? The package, the compression package will read compressed data from a reader and then decompress it, right? So it's reading out, decompressing it, and then, you know, putting, um, writing the results somewhere, or putting the results somewhere else, right? And similarly, a write, you write into it compressed data, and, and it'll decode it and, and decompress it, and, and uh, do something with results. Um, it, it doesn't quite make sense conceptually until you kind of see some examples, right? So, so this example here, you can find the code at, at this link. But basically, where's my mouse? Um, so, basically, right? If if the source is is just this squish me string and we want to gzip it, right? What we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to create a new empty buffer, right? Because the writer has to have some place to put the compressed data, right? So we give it the the squish me, the uncompressed squish me, and then the as we write to it, the gzip engine compresses it and shoves it in the buffer. So at this point, buff buffer contains our compressed data. You with me so far? Does it make sense? All right. So now we're going to do the opposite, right? We're going to make a new reader out of buffer, right? And the, you always check your errors, but this is sample code, so I'm skipping it now. But so now we've got this gzip reader. So now what gzip does is it creates a new reader with a buffer, but it doesn't necessarily do anything until I try and read from it. And as I you know read from it, it's going to decompress. Or decompress. I think it. I don't know if it decompresses ahead of time or not. I'll have to double check. But conceptually, it's this kind of going on, um, either ahead of time or, or on demand. As you read from the gzip reader, it, it'll pull out the decompressed data. Does that make sense? What is that? I would imagine that it doesn't certainly Probably. I, I feel like it's going to do it on demand, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does it on demand. Because that, that makes more sense for readers to write. Any questions here? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we can, we can look at this just to, just to prove I'm not insane. So here we give it the squish me at the top, we compress it, we decompress it, and we should see squish me at the bottom, and, and no errors. 
And sure enough, it says squish me and no errors. Make sense? Yay, it works. <laughs> All right. So real quick, a variant of compress. We talked about how we don't want to overuse README. Um, and it turns out this is kind of one of those examples, right? What we're doing is, is we're taking the, the reader and, and we're reading all of it and you know, getting the output and then printing that out, right? It turns out that um, you know, stand, all, we're doing, if, if all we're doing is putting it to standard out. You can have writers you know, that write to standard out, right? So we can use the, 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 the top half of this is all the same. So I apologize if this is a little bit low on the TV. But these last two lines here, right? basically what we're doing is we're saying, uh oh, this is a typo. typo. So, so basically what we're saying is, instead of going through that read all function, directly read from the gzip reader and copy that data and write it out to standard out. Right? So this is one of those ways you can bypass the read all or that last conversion function and just get it out to some other output. So this is a strong example of chaining right? and, and, and not overusing read all. Because otherwise you're just creating kind of these intermediate objects for no good reason. Well, in some cases, like sometimes it makes sense to output to standard out. You know, um, in in the case of like a web page, right? You know, this this might be just writing out to like a you know like a JSON encoder, which writes out to a uh, you know like a, a REST you know, a client, like a REST client. Or something like that. So there's a lot of different ways you can slice and dice this. So that makes sense. But yeah, the. For here, like, you know, like, however you want to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to, to kind of connect them and join them. Um, so that was an example of copy, the io.copy function. Um, encoding, right? This is not unlike the, you know, the, like the compression or the archive type stuff. Basically, encoding is um, for for JSON in particular, that most people here are probably familiar with the marshal and the unmarshal functions uh, in, in the JSON package. That's where you take again a, a scalar, or not a scalar, but like a, an actual chunk of data, like a, a byte slice, typically, and, and encode it or decode it. But there are decoder encoder variants, right, which operate on I/O readers and I/O writers instead of like large chunks, right? So if you've got a very large, you know, JSON array, you know, you probably want to consider this. It, it theoretically is going to use, um, you know, less memory over uh, over very very large things because you're not creating um, large intermediate um, byte slices. Like that. So it lowers your memory pressure in, in, in uh, non-ideal cases. Uh, I don't actually have an example of this in the actual slide deck. The standard library has a fantastic example built right into it. Uh, so that's something you know, in fact, I probably could just bring it up here. Yeah, you know, uh, so, so, Coding JSON package. Okay. So this one here, we can just run this example. And you see what it's doing is it's got this JSON stream, right? And, and in this case, it's, it's, it's a bunch of different um, JSON streams, you know, line separated JSON streams. And the, you are, it, it creates the reader, right? And so with the decoder, you give the decoder the reader, the decoder reads from it, and decodes the JSON stream um, internally here. And in this case, it's decoding it one at a time until uh, until it sees an end of file. So we see that uh, a bunch of different. Well, that's hilarious. Go format yourself. Yeah. So will it? So will it? Um, yeah. It'll read an entire JSON set. That's how the sites work. Yeah. So if you one, have just one JSON thing, it will still read that. All. It'll do it once and then give you an end of file at the end of the reader. In this case, we've actually got five discrete JSON yeah. um, chunks. Yeah. yeah. Make sense? Yeah. These are useful if you're doing a lot of JSON decoding of a lot of different JSONs because basically you make one decoder and then you don't have to initialize or deinitialize the, decode, the, the, the decoder. You just make it once and then you just reuse it over and over and over again. Uh, the marshal and the unmarshal way, you're doing a lot of setup and, and tear down um, every time you do that. Not a lot, it's, it's, it's minimal, but uh, in some you know, extremely pathological cases, this might, this might save you some combination of memory pressure and time. Is this source graph? No, this is a application called Dash. It's an offline documentation viewer, and, and I love it. It's amazing. 
basically it allows you to, to search um, for, for tokens in, in basically all the different things. I want to say, these, these are the ones I do like CSS and Python and JavaScript and stuff like that. But it supports like, I want to say 40 or 50 different languages and, and packages and stuff. So that's actually one of my favorite apps. So this is highly recommended. I think version 3 just came out. This is version 2, but it's kind of an amazing piece of software if you have, if you have a Mac and, and you don't hate the App Store or something like that. So, um, highly recommend. But yeah, so just like just JSON, and I can see that there's a package or, or different primitives or tokens that have the JSON here. And whatnot. In fact, the decoder was the one that was before. It's got the. It's got it, the runs, um, it must run the code live. Um, so. No, so this what this does is this actually kicks it to play dot go That's what I'm network. saying. It has to actually go out to the network. Yeah. So no, it calls out to the network. Okay, so that's just an HTML view or somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. Um. All right. Back to my slide. All right, to my slides are back. Okay, does this make sense? How to use the encoder decoder variants of, of the, the JSON package? Any questions here? All right, one more example and then uh, we'll, we'll move on. So, so again, I talked about the, the HTTP handler interface. This is probably the, one of the more famous ones. The, basically, you get a request, right? And then part of the request is the body field, which is an, a, a read closer. It means you, you read it. Um, this one's kind of misleading because most of the time you don't actually close it. The actual underlying, excuse me, web server will close it for you. So uh, this one is a closer, but you don't usually have to worry too much about that. But um, someone does need to close it because it is a source of no, common leaks. Yeah. Yeah. If, is it, is if so, people ignore yeah. closing the body, then that's a common way that a program grows All right. memory usage over time. Very good, very good. They don't close it. Yeah, so make sure to close it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the documentation is a little unclear on that. You know, I, I sometimes I'll, I'll read it like three or four times. I, 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 so, so I need to, need to close it, or will someone else close it for me? Or do I expect the, the underlying web server or a router to close it? Um, yes, yeah, so you might have to do some of your own um, investigation out of that. Keys are mostly as well as when you're doing stuff like client. Yeah. Um, yeah. Clients, yes. yeah. clients yeah. definitely yeah. wrapped. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Clients, if, if you have a client that's doing a request, you definitely need to close it. Um, oh, that's, no that's a response. Yeah. The, the oh, servers, okay. my understanding is the servers usually will close it for you. So the, the response writer, of course, is a writer, um, and that's that's you know if, if you are implementing your own HTTP server, that's where you write. The, you get the request from some client, you know, like get you know the, the root directory, and then you write out the response, like open bracket HTTP close bracket so, welcome to my neighborhood or whatever it is. Um, so here's an example of kind of all of the above. What, what we got going on here is that the, the uh, getting the body like. It, one of the things that happen is usually the, the request has like the URL and all that other stuff in there. But here, you know, this is kind of a dumb server. All we're doing is we're, we're, we're looking at the body, we're, we're stuffing in here, and then we're, we're doing something. If we get an error, right? Um, there, there's, there's a handful of different ways to write a response out of this method. Here's one example of using the built-in error uh, method of HTTP, right? Basically, you give it the response writer. And it'll basically do all the, the appropriate stuff for you with respect to the error code and some kind of message. You know. In this case, the message is something has gone terribly, spelled wrong, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to bug. And you probably also want to return. Yeah, you want to return. Otherwise, it keeps running. Yeah, that one always gets me. Every time. The interface is really irritating. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that appropriate that most of spelled wrong? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> something has gone terribly wrong. Um, the, you know, there, there's a handful of other ways to write to the re response writer. You could use old-fashioned IO writer type methods, right? We talked about fprint earlier, right? This is just writing in arbitrary data via the, the, the formatting um, methods, right? Um, you could pipe in data from some other reader, like if you had a, a buffer of some kind. Remember, every buffer is a reader and a writer, right? Basically, here, you're just doing copy. You're copying, you're reading from here and writing out over the network to the client, things like that, right? If you had some kind of data of some kind already. Um, or, or in some cases, you know, this, this might come from a JSON there's encoder. No, there's no you, could, you could just pass it straight through from a JSON encoder as well. Um, 
Another option is to use the built-in convenience method, which is response.write. And this is kind of the more classical traditional way. You see this a lot of where you're just writing out the data that you want to write. You know, because it's, it's certainly convenient, and you don't have to mess with readers and writers. Um, you're dealing with straight up byte slices. Uh, but uh, the, uh, yeah, the, a lot of options. Uh, the, this response writer in particular, I think that was intentional. I think they wanted to have, uh, I think they understood there are a lot of different paradigms for responding to uh, an HTTP request, so pretty flexible in that sense. Any questions here? Does this make sense? Yeah. And what this is going to do here, this particular method, if you get it here, it's going to stop, but here we're actually going to write out three different times to the output. Right? We're writing out arbitrary data, and then we're writing out whatever's inside this JSON buffer, and then we're writing out convenience. So this is going to be a mess of HTML. It's not even real HTML. It's going to be a mess of data on the actual client side, so, so don't worry. You know, this, this is not, you know, this is more example than an actual um, illustration. So it is just appending the data? Yep. Okay. It's just writing and writing and writing out. I always forget the return. So when you start writing, I mean, this question, uh, when you start writing, does it send all the headers and like, start writing yeah. immediately? Yeah. So the very first write to an HTTP response writer will trigger, will, will, before it actually writes out your data, it'll send the headers first and then everything there. So if you want to mutate the header, you have to do it before the first write. Right? So wherever your first write is, it doesn't matter if it's here, here, or here. Like, you know, in this case, it's this fprint statement. Right? So you've got to mutate the header before you send the first write. Will you get an error if you don't do that? Or just no, it'll, it'll default to like 200 OK or something like that. Well, I'm saying if you try to mutate the error afterwards. It, it'll, it'll just sign with me. It'll just ignore you. It says, yeah, go ahead and, and change that error header. <laughs> or change the header, but I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> yeah. and so silently fail all the wrong. It'll just silently do nothing. Which I guess is usually a failure. Make sense? Are you guys with me so far? A couple of droopy eyes. Maybe that's me. Maybe that's just me. <laughs> it has been a long. It's been a long week. Uh, yeah, it's Tuesday already. I can't believe it. Um, all right. So that's the last of the examples. I think I do want to talk about making a custom reader and writer because all this stuff in the standard library is great and fun and cool, but it, if you're not rolling your own, then you're not hardcore. And we're all about being hardcore here. Um, except we're not. We're not really about being hardcore. It's just posturing. <laughs> so, all right. So what I actually have needed in practice is a counting buffer. I needed to know every time I write to a buffer, how many bytes has actually gone through. Right? And so this is something I've actually taken from, from real code that I've written, I don't know, somewhere in January or February or sometime. So, a counting buffer, in practice, is supposed to have a count of all the bytes you've ever written to it, and then all the bytes you've ever read out from it. Now, this is a pretty lousy counting buffer, because I only implemented the right half. That, you know, but the, if you understand this, it should be trivial to you know, extend this and, and you know, actually count the, buff, you know, the bytes written, uh, you can read out of it. So right now, we're only counting the bytes written. So um, the, the somewhat embarrassing real-life code where I originally needed this function you can find it at amadn, github.com slash amadn slash parallel, P-A-R-A-L. Um, and then specifically, the uh, appropriately named counting underscore buffer dot go, if you're super curious about that. Um, and again, the reader, the counting, the bytes read out of it is, is not yet implemented and left as an exercise to the, the readers. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, so. The way I basically did it is, well, I got to have a couple of variables, you know, a couple of, of integers where I can hold the number of, of bytes read or written. Um, and in this case, we really just care about um, the bytes uh, written into the buffer, right? Um, I, I reuse the bytes.buffer, again, the most common buffer that you're going to see in the system. That, that, that gives me a lot of good implementation for free. Um, uh, I do have, um, this is actually different. These are actually, I'm currently using read, write, mutexes, and we'll get to the difference in a little bit here. But, <coughs> as I edit my slides on the fly. Um, and then I have a bunch of read, write, new texts um, to help me along with that. Um, there is a slide at the very end. Um, we'll touch on you know, the difference between a read, write, new text versus a regular new text. So, so just kind of bear with me for now. Um, so, so a little uh, slight digression into what bytes.buffer you know, buffer is. Um, and this is actually wrong. This is not a package. This is, this is a. This is a structure inside of the bytes package. 
So basically, bytes that buffer is, is a very, very flexible you know, buffer with a lot of the bells and whistles included. You, know, you can create new buffers. We talked about the two ways to do that already. Right? You, can, you can grow them if they're too small, or, or clear and reset the buffer, or, or truncate it if it's too big, things like that, so you can adjust the size. Um, you can get metadata about the buffer, like how much um, is in there. Um, you can, uh, there, there are different convenience getters, like if I wanted to turn the contents of the buffer into a byte slice or, or a string, um, or, or kind of iterate through through it one at a time. There's stuff in there that you can do. Um, there are lots of different read um, operations, you know, because the whole point of a buffer is to read to it and write from it. Um, there's a couple here that are kind of misleading. Um, write to is, is actually a reading function, and, and read from is a writing function. So so be care be careful of the wording there. It's, it's a little bit. Um, of a misnomer, and we'll get to that in detail. Um, unread byte and unread rune. So you remember read byte and read rune, they allow you to read one byte at a time or one Unicode character at a time, right? This is like just going backwards a little bit, right? So the, this is something that, that they have in there as well. Um, and again, you've got the, the right variants down here. Um, so makes sense so far? You guys, have, if you look at the source code, most of this is, is straightforward. The documentation and or the source code, you know, most of this is fairly straightforward. What so with the counting buffer, since we inherited, we embedded the, the bytes.buffer, we get all that stuff for free, but there are a whole bunch of places where we have to you know, implement slash override. You know, basically, throw in our counting function and, and wrap it around the, the underlying buffer writing, as it were. Right? So, so these are the one. Again, this one here, don't be fooled. This, this writes to the buffer. Um, the, the way this works uh, is it continuously, like in a, in a, in a for loop, reads from reader that you pass it and then writes into the buffer. So it's, it's one of these pipeline style um, writing methods, right? So um, we'll get to this one. Um, so the first four of these are, are actually very fairly straightforward, right? Like, um, what we're doing is we're, for the write function, we basically override. We use the, the, the write function that bytes buffer gives us. Um, and then we, we just increment our total in counter. I use safe ink, total in, um, count safe ink. This is just a wrapper around the, the read write new text. So that, that's all it's doing. It's in, incrementing by n the, the number of bytes we've written. So it's just got the read, read write new text on the inside for, for um, thread safety and whatnot. Um, so write string, all these are functionally the same thing. We use the inner buffer implementation and then right after we increment our counter. Right? So fairly straightforward. Um, the, obviously, when if I'm writing a single byte or writing a single rune, I just increment by one. So nothing too special there. Assuming nothing's gone wrong. These here probably should have wrappers. Uh, well, these don't need wrappers around air like over here because, you know, for a partial read we want to make sure we count the, the partial, the actual six. I'm sorry. For a partial write we want to count the number of writes that successfully happened before we got to some air. Okay. So read from that that really really weird one. So we can't directly use the parent read from, right? Because on the inside, it's a for loop that basically blocks until we're done, right? So read from needs to be a little bit more continuous, real timey, you know, whatever, however you want to think of it or phrase it, right? Um, so what we do is, is this is basically just completely copy and pasting the entire read from implementation in the bytes.buffer code. It's not very long, and it's fairly straightforward. Basically, we, we you know, it, it assumes that, you know, you start with a small buffer space, right? If if you're reading from a very large reader into you know, the, the, the right operation you're doing, it, it'll try and grow the buffer if necessary. Um, but other, other than that, you're basically just iterating around a read operation. right? And then whatever you read, you copy that into the right buffer. Or, or I'm sorry, into the writer, uh, you know, into this particular writer. Does that make sense so far? Now, because this is calling the counting buffer write, right? This is where the actual um, write happens, and then basically it's calling this guy here. So that's this is where our counter is being incremented um, inside our, you know, our counting buffer implementation of write. Uh, and let's see here. Um, th there is some cleanup, you know, just looking for end of files or, or, or you know, uh, if we get error functions, basically we need to be able to, uh, to return the the appropriate numbers in that case. Um, and then after that, you know, if everything is good, you know, when, when we're finally done reading from, we get the end of file or we get the, the error, then, then we'll return as done. 
Any questions here? Uh, I know these are kind of um, overlapping a little bit. Uh, the is the normal pattern to copy like to do something like that, or would so? I mean, is that considered the same practice for going? Yeah, this is a little bit of a special case, you know, because the for loop kind of mucks stuff up. If, if, if the inner function has that for loop in there, you can't break into the inside of that, right? So, so this is why this is why I did it this way. Um, it's, it's basically, you know, it's basically the exact same thing. Copy paste it. So the, I think normally it's not, <laughs> but in this case, it just made a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, I guess if you, if you didn't do it that way, you'd have somebody just really crazy. Yeah, stuff. if you didn't do that way, we basically this becomes a blocking, right? And it's not that you, you don't get that continuous streaming uh, functionality that you really want. You're waiting for the whole thing to finish before, before it does it. So I, I think normally it's not normal, but in this case, it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. This, this felt like the yeah. lowest, right. lowest friction uh, method of accomplishing what I wanted. It actually works really, really well. At this point, I can use a counting buffer anywhere I would use a normal buffer, um, mm -hmm. and I will actually be able to introspect and see how many bytes are have been written at any point in time. And you know, if necessary, update a UI. Um, in, in the case of the function that I needed for it, it actually just outputs um, uh, onto the standard output. It's got some nice cursor-based, um, you know, it basically allows you to see how many bytes have, have gone have been processed in, in any given um, uh, chunk of, of, of stuff. So it's pretty convenient. It works out pretty well. Any questions so far on, on implementing custom stuff? Um, the counting buffer and what we're doing here. All of this makes sense, you know, why why we overrid over uh, overrode the, the functions we did and all that. Um, buffer is actually a really nice place to start from if, if you're doing something like this because again you get a lot of the bells and whistles for free. Uh, the actual implementation is, is you know, you know, for the right side, there's about five of them that you have to do, and we talked about all five of those. For the read side, you're probably going to have to implement all of these. And you know, like if I wanted to create a, a read counter, I, I would do almost the same thing. This one here, almost certainly, I'd have to copy and paste from the from the underlying implementation. But the rest of these, I would just wrap it. Um, this one's a little tricky because I would have to decrement our, our counter. Um, I don't know if I. But you know, the, nothing too special there. Unreading is just you know, moving one back. Um, maybe maybe that's not actually what you want in accounting for your account. I'm not exactly sure. Probably that's kind of I think what I would do. All right, the end is in sight. I think we've got like one more slide. Um, so I did promise to talk about read write mutex. Basically, this is just a generic uh, mutex designed to lock a single writer at any given time or um, allow any number of of, of readers. Right, so it's very, very common in, in the read-write world that you know you can have as many readers as you want, but as soon as someone tries to write, you got to stop everything else. You can only have one writer at a time. Um, and, but if you have readers, you can have as many readers as you want. So basically, they've got the lock and unlock, which you're familiar with from from the mutex world. But they've also got a read lock and a read unlock. Um, you know, specifically so that a lot of readers can can read simultaneously, because you know if nobody's writing, then you know it's usually not a problem if people are trying to read simultaneously. You've got to an intelligent cache in there. Any questions? Uh, okay. Yeah. Does, does that make right, sense? Okay, so that actually took longer than I thought. Um, that's actually the very end of my presentation. So, um, for wait, right, nobody move. I got to count. All right, twenty-two of you. Thank you. This is like a record turnout. I'm super grateful. Do you have a question? There's a question over there. I was just wondering if it made. But so the usual use case for the multiple reader single writer is that you're just trying to lock access to the to whatever it is that you read. Yeah. So you're actually updating counters. So is it possible you could have two come in and then modify the counter with exactly the same value? So so the read lock means that anyone on any thread at any point in time can read it, as long as no one's trying to mutate it, right? So I, I only have one person can change the counter at the same time. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, sorry, that's yeah. not it. I get that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but if I have like five different Go routines trying to read from the. But you're not counting how much they're reading out of it. You're only counting how much is writing out of it because I thought. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so anyone at any time, you know, the can. When I say read, I'm, I, I mean get use the accessors here. Basically, there is a total in accessor, uh, okay. which will get a read lock. Read it. In fact, I can show you the code. It looks like this. Um, 
looks like this. So it's reading the counters, not reading the buffer. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, so here, in, in the case if I want to know how many bytes I've written in, it gets a read lock. Okay. It defers the unlock, okay. and then it returns. Right. And then it just it's probably a semaphore, yeah. and it counts up, and it counts the, up. The total in safe increment is it gets the right lock, it defers right. the, the unright lock, and then it, right. it changes the, the okay. it increments by delta. Right. And I guess delta can be negative here. There's nothing preventing it from decrementing if I needed to. But yeah, it's, hard to it's hard to unwrite something. Any questions? Yeah, and then the rest of the stuff should, should see. I, I, I did uh, implement a clear count if I wanted to clear these, if I wanted to reset the counters. Um, but then the rest of the stuff you saw in the slides. The right, the right string, and then again, this read from, and then the right byte and the right room stuff down here. Make sense? Mm -hmm. see that. But yeah, so this is this is fairly simple. It's, it's all of a 130-some uh, lines of code, roughly, maybe, maybe even less. 